Well, welcome, Bruce. It's so great to see you and so glad you could join us again for another conversation about the state of law in our country in 2024. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. Always great to be with you. Well, great to see you, my friend. Um, and Bruce, uh, you know, just before we dive into this uh, far-reaching conversation about the law and its impact on our society, I know that uh, you're both a professor at Queen's University in law, but also the executive director of, um, of Rights Probe. Could you tell us more about that organization and your work? Yes, yes, by all means. So Rights Probe is a branch of the Energy Probe Research Foundation. And we're essentially a, uh, a law and liberty think tank. We, we look into research, write about, speak about the ways in which the, the, the legal ground is shifting underneath our feet. And it's, the, the, we want to shed light on the realization that a lot of Canadians are starting to have, which is that the legal system does not work the way they thought it did. Oh. And they have the rights that they think that they do. And, and part of our mandate is to explain why that is and why the things in the law are not going the way that a lot of Canadians want them to go. Okay, so, so this is just so relevant, I think, for today, as you allude to this, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but kind of a two world views of what the law should be. We, I think we've got more of a, a traditional view of law that most people or citizens would assume is functioning, as you allude to, and the emergence of a new kind of law focuses more on outcomes. Is that what you're referring to, that kind of debate? Yes. So essentially, if you look at the legal system in Canada today, and for that matter, the system in, in a lot of Western countries, there's an internal battle going on that mm. people can't see. And that battle is between sort of two different paradigms, if you like, or, or, or systems or ideologies that consist of a number of premises or features or characteristics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, for example... One system, the older paradigm, is what we might call the rule of law paradigm. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the newer one is a rule by law paradigm in which law is merely an instrument for the state to manage society. And, you know, that it might not, those labels might not sound terribly different, but they are 180 degree, 80 degrees about. Uh, rule of law essentially means that the state is restrained in what it does, that the mm -hmm. people who rule us are subject to the same rules as everybody else, that the rules are made ahead of time, that they're understandable, that people can plan their activities so as to comply with the law and, 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 and that the laws are general and abstract and certain. If you look at the way things are actually done today in the law, the, those principles are not followed at all. We have rule by law instead, which means that most of the rules are made uh, by the executive or administrative branch, not by the legislature, that they are made um, in an agile way. Agile government is, the, is the, uh, the aspiration of the managerial idea, which is that governments have their hands on everything and they can change the rules as they go, oh, which, means, which means that if they can change the rules as you go, that means you can't be subject to them because if you don't like them, you can change them. Okay, so, so this is probably a bombshell for a lot of people. I know that you are within that field, but it reminds me of a very famous quote by our friend John Adams uh, right. so many years ago that they aimed to found, found, and this is in the context of the United States, a government of laws and not by men. Is that what you're right. getting at here? That's exactly what we're getting at, right? So, so the whole idea of the rule of law is just that. The rule of law is the alternative to the rule of persons. Mm -hmm. And by that, we mean we shouldn't have any particular person or persons with the, with the power to dictate how we all act. And the way you do that is to set up limits and restraints and checks and balances. And, Indeed, and, yes. Right? And, and one, of, one of those checks and balances is, is to separate powers between mm -hmm. the different branches of the state. So the legislature makes the rules. And the executive executes those rules and the and the and the courts mm -hmm. apply the rules, right? But today what happens is the legislature passes legislation that delegates rulemaking authority to the executive branch. And so most of our rules today are not made by the legislature, they're made by the executive. And so yeah. immediately you have a breakdown of the separation of powers idea. And now we are essentially being ruled by individual 
officers and bureaucrats and agencies mm -hmm. and so on who are making rules on the fly. Okay, so this is a major wake-up call, I believe, for every Canadian. I think in conversation with so many people anecdotally, they, they would have really no clue about this. Intuitively, they might believe that they're subject to a lot of the whims of um, powerful um, unelected bureaucrats and all the rest. But this is this is a almost a fundamentally different perspective on what we think is the, the nature of people and power. And therefore, if we're to design good governance systems, um, we need to have checks and balances. We need to have healthy debate, freedom of discussion. So we can say, well, you know what? Uh, I agree with you on that point, Bruce, but man, you're out to lunch on this other one. And, and we can learn from each other. So right. we, we really, this begs the question, what is the, the perspective this new law system has on um, our democracy and how our society should function. Yes. So part of the problem is that the old paradigm uh, reflected ideas and principles that that a lot of people had in their heads, and so mm. they 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 complied with it because they believed in it, and that that especially includes the people who were in power. We had people like John Adams expressing ideas that mm -hmm. were consistent with the, both 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 this paradigm, but also. The constitution itself and as long as the people in power believe in these ideas you got no problem but but once the people in power don't believe in the ideas anymore then you have a you have a you have a real problem because mm -hmm. the checks and balances are almost are almost honor systems and therefore if you don't have people who are going to honor them they're they don't work so okay. part of the problem with our constitutional order is that that is it is possible it is possible to dishonor it and if it does if it is dishonored then it doesn't work very well okay but that that makes a lot of sense bruce in the sense that without trying to sound like a romantic a lot of this is written on our hearts whether we actually believe it and carry it in our behaviors every day um and we do need to function with the rule of law and there are a lot of people over history that have died over this, Bruce, as you know, oh, yeah. in civil oh, yeah. wars, because they said, you know what, you're rigging the whole system to run your own little, um, well, it's a racket, basically, of power, and you're running and serving yourself and not the people. Is this kind of like, I'm, I know I'm simplifying it, but isn't that kind of the divide that we're going to start rubbing up to as yeah. we get these different perspectives on how the law should look? Well, Yes, but what has happened ever since the Magna Carta is that we, you know, we've gone through an important evolution. It took a very long time, um, but but gradually we took power away from the king, mm. mm -hmm. and we gave it we gave it to legislatures. But then the Americans took power away from the legislatures and gave it to courts with their Bill of Rights. And then what has happened? is that the courts together with the legislature has now passed power back to what was once the king but is no longer is now the administrative state right so all we have ever done since the magna carta is move power around from one institution to the other one thinking mm -hmm. thinking that we're creating checks and balances and that worked for a while but what's what's happening today is that those checks and balances all those branches of the state are more or less on the same page and working together. Instead of being in constant conflict and checking and balancing each other, they're cooperating and believing in the same thing, which is that the state should manage society. I mean, the courts uh -huh. believe that, the legislature believes that, and certainly the, the administrative state and, believes that. And, and so by the administrative state, help us understand what you mean yeah. by that. Do you mean like right. experts, people who... Yes, kind of right. know better than us. They're like the good and the great. In other words, they they have the, the prerogative great, to the, rule over us. The 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 expert technocrats that that, mm. that that exist inside the bureaucracy. So we're talking about these three branches still, and this mm. is the executive branch, which has grown now into the administrative state. Some people mm. even make the case, and I think it's probably a good one, that that, that this third branch, the executive, has grown into a, a third and fourth branch. So you have the executive. Mm. Mm -hmm. Which are which is the political power holders, the prime minister's office and the cabinet and the premier's office and so on, and then the fourth branch is this deep state, the 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 uncontrollable permanent bureaucracy 
that calls the shots on so many things in government is are these other branches, the administrative state. And, okay, and, uh, so those, I, I think you're those, onto something, Bruce. Yeah, here, I mean, yeah. you know, I sometimes it's been the term "deep state" has been thrown around, um, almost in a, a kind of a tinfoil hat type right. of reference that yeah. it somehow doesn't exist. Well, no, the the facts are that a deep state does exist. If you mean by a large state that has never been larger before. And it is, you know, we, it's a bit of, it's opaque. It's a bit of a black box in terms of understanding how they make decisions and who's really making those decisions. Is that what you're getting at? Exactly so. Exactly so. And so that that moniker, deep state, uh, has been used by some people in the past to denote a source of power that is not controllable mm -hmm. by the elected politicians. Now, people... Indeed. There, there's a there's a tension, right? People think that the politicians are evil and that they shouldn't have control over everything. And mm -hmm. I understand where that comes from. But on the other hand, do you want the reverse? Do you want unelected bureaucrats mm -hmm. who can't be controlled in terms of what they do? And so neither one of those answers is really very good. Mm -hmm. But but the deep state is used to denote the situation where you've got people in power making decisions that that are not subject to democratic controls and uh, are only subject to judicial control if and when the courts decide that they've overstepped their boundaries. Mm -hmm. and, and in the modern era, the judicial tendency is to defer to the expertise of the technocracy. Mm -hmm. So we are not protected in, in that way for the most part either. No, I, I think you're exactly right. So we are truly at the perennial fork in the roads on this issue. We need to to think consciously about this fork in the road, right, Bruce? We need to consciously say, are we going to renew our commitment to the traditional rule of law, or are we going to go down this socialist interpretation of what the law should be? Is that yes. it? Well, yes, except that there's a problem. And the problem is this. The rule of, a, the rule of law, which is a fabulous idea, is still just an idea. Mm. And it only works to control those who govern if those people believe in the idea. And right now they do not. And so the problem is, how, how can we change the nature of our government so that we don't require those people to believe in things and, that, and, and so as to prevent them from doing as they now believe? Because what they now believe is it is their job to manage everything. And that, that, that can't be allowed to happen. And so I think we need to rethink what the what the premises are of the way we make government. Okay, I think you're onto something. So in that way, the law is a bit symptomatic of a deeper issue that the state is simply too far reaching and they are meddling and trying to control every aspect of our life. And the law just reflects that philosophy. And therefore, it's almost self-reinforcing as you have bad law it allows the state to give, get even bigger and even control more of our lives. Yes, it? yes, yes. And this, and this, this is a symptom of having a, 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 a rule by law system as opposed to a rule of law. Rule by law simply means that the, that, the, that the state actors are simply using laws, passing them, creating new ones, simply to tell people what to do. And that's its only function. It is to, it is to make lawful the orders they wish to put in place. And it, exactly. it, has no, it has no other substance to it than that. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.